That's what I want. Great. So thank you for joining us for the CIVL general information session. There are three training sessions that we do. One general background information, history of CIVL, history of campus, community radio in general. Um, session two is programming rules and regulations, uh, do's and don'ts, half do's and can'ts. And uh, session three is tech training, is how to use the equipment. And so each of these takes about two hours generally, more or less, depending on how much discussion we have. But the purpose of recording here is to make it accessible online so you don't have to schedule a time with a staff member. You can go through the orientation and then just check in afterwards and 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 make sure you're you can answer any you have any questions answered that you have. So for the first information session, the main presentation points we'll go over are what CIVL radio is, what is this organization you're interested in getting engaged with, uh, what kind of programs we have at our radio station, what kind of programming we do. Uh, where you can find out about our programmer agreements and expectations. Oh, that's another tab I'll have to open up later. How to be a programmer. So the steps to take to get involved um, and to have a show approved and to and to be doing a regular show if that's what you're interested in. Uh, and any questions that you have, we can answer as we go along. Are there any questions before we get going after we've just looked at that brief overview? Okay, I have Raymond here and then Nicholas and uh, Jack here in the studio, uh, and we're all going to go through this session together. So the first thing we'll talk about is what is campus and community radio specifically or in general, depending on how you want to look at it. We'll talk about what CIVL's mission, values, and goals are as an organization, our specific organization, as opposed to other campus community radio stations where it may differ. We'll talk about that later. A history of civil radio, it's going to be a brief history because we have somewhat of a long history at this point. As of this recording, we're producing a, a documentary about our 20 years of our operation. Um, how we are structured, how this organization is structured, but it's also very similar to basically all any nonprofits that you'll get involved with and most charities as well. And we'll talk about some other campus community radio stations, and that's where we'll see that our mission values and goals may be different than some although they're all very similar as a whole, because the government actually regulates radio as a whole, and specifically campus and community radio. So the first thing we'll talk about, generally speaking, is what community and campus radio is versus, versus commercial radio. So there are two general kind of categories of, of radio in Canada. And the primary is commercial radio. And then there's community radio. And under community radio is also certain stations that are like us, campus stations. So the regulations as a whole apply to all of us. The way you apply for a station, the process you go through, the, the technical parameters you have to follow are all the same for both types of stations, uh, but operations are somewhat different between commercial and community radio stations. So first off, what can we talk, can we think about, does anybody have a suggestion of what uh, commercial radio station they're familiar with is? 99.3. 99.3, that's the Fox? I don't even know. That's <laughs> like something that generates money. So if you ask me, Yes, the purpose of commercial radio is to make money, okay? And it's not, it's not a personal opinion, but that is how it's structured uh, in terms of regulation, legislation, and general operation of a commercial station. So yes, a commercial station is there. Uh, whoever owns that station, they may by chance, if they own a jazz station, they may love jazz, have a passion for jazz, but they wouldn't be operating a jazz station if it wasn't going to be profitable. Uh, so in that sense, the commercial operations will focus on uh, on running a, a profitable business. So that means that there's three unique kind of features to a commercial radio uh, that aren't, they're not unique in the commercial world, but they're unique compared to campus community radio. So those features are that A, yeah, their goal is to turn a profit, to get the most listenership as possible so that they can sell advertising 
to that listenership. And in order to ensure that they're going to be commercially successful, financially viable, they're going to make sure that they have staff that are hired to be directed to do the work of operating the radio station in the way that is most profitable. And that is the goal. The goal is not to enrich the community. The goal is not to provide a service to local organizations, groups, or communities. Uh, the goal is to make money. And there are requirements that the government has so that there are communities that can benefit, the business community can benefit, or certain types of, of infrastructure or industry can benefit, but ultimately no ownership will be operating a commercial radio station if it's no longer viable. If it's losing money, they're probably going to look at selling the station, moving the station, reorganizing the content of the station. Um, and, the, and the content itself, so the they're looking to make money, one, they're hiring staff full-time to, to, mostly full-time to, to earn them that money. And the content that staff are instructed to air is content that will be conducive to making money. So on a commercial radio station, like if, if I'm not wrong, in 99.3 is the Fox, it's hard rock. It's popular hard rock music, like Nickelback and uh, uh, throw me some other popular uh, hard rock music, right? Um, on Green Day. Green Day, they'll play. Very popular band, right? 21 Pilots, probably. Very popular band with popular songs. People will listen. They'll hear that. They'll tune in. And then while they're listening to their favorite hard rock songs, there will be an advertising break. And all the people who tuned in to hear that popular music, who are excited about that music, they're gonna hear advertisements that companies have paid for to be on the radio. Uh, and, and the ownership wants those listeners to stay listening so that they can sell them, sell their ears, as opposed to eyeballs and television. And in fact, in commercial media, uh, they look at two types, of, two types of stuff that they'll air. They'll air content and they'll air filler. And in commercial radio, the filler is what we would consider the content. The music is the filler. What commercial radio considers the content, and the same in television, the content is the advertising. So the filler is there in order to facilitate advertising being bought, eyeballs and ears being sold. And this makes sense in the commercial market, right? So, but as a result, you won't have volunteers at a commercial radio station uh, you'll really rarely have students at a commercial radio station. Sometimes there will be from a professional broadcast program, co-op opportunities or practicum placements, these kinds of things. Those people generally won't be on air. They'll generally be doing busy work behind the scenes, very tightly supervised by, by staff members who are paid. So on the contrary, community radio is something that in the 1970s, the Canadian government legislated to create a uh, legislative interest infrastructure for in order to provide if we're all only operating on camp on community. Sorry, if we're only operating on commercial radio and all of the frequencies in Canada are taken up by commercial radio that is intended to earn and make money, uh, then that means that individual Canadians who aren't doing something profitable will not have access to the frequencies, to the airwaves. They won't be able to engaged. They won't be able to uh, promote or uh, platform content or ideas or topics, uh, and they won't be able to make selections that reflect their experiences, their ideas, their needs, their communities. And so the government uh, legislated a way that we now have a campus, or it was actually originally a community radio sector, so that individuals and groups who are not represented by the commercial uh, mainstream can have access to a slice of the frequencies. And in different communities, people can tune into non-commercial concepts. So that's how community operate uh, community radio is generally structured. There are ways that we are legislated so that we won't be able to compete with commercial radio. So for instance, we're not allowed to play more than 10% top 40 hits on a commercial on a community campus radio station. That's one specific requirement. We're also not allowed to, even if we're not playing hits, if we did have great connections in the community, at the point of applying for our license, we tell the government how much advertising income we expect to be earning off of the community. So presumably we're gonna be earning that off of the same types of businesses that are paying local com commercial stations, 
And so the government wants to know, well, how much of an impact on that market are you going to make? How much of those funds are you going to bite into? And so at CIVL, we've told them basically none. We don't expect to advertise to local businesses in a large way. We may do advertising to very local businesses, but we don't expect to be earning hundreds of thousands of dollars of income. Uh, that would that would uh, threaten commercial radio's ability to earn that money from those same businesses. Uh, and it is the government's goal that each individual commercial radio station will be as financially successful as possible. So they legislate for the purpose of uh, ensuring that the, the, the GDP as contributed to by commercial radio endeavors uh, is growing at all times. And so a com community radio station breaking into that would harm the, the ultimate commercial radio GDP. Now, there are numbers that break down how much money is made by commercial radio, by community radio, by indigenous radio stations who are also similarly licensed to community radio stations. Um, but that is that is one significant piece of how regulation works for commercial versus community radio. So we talked about those three pieces, uh, the funding, the staffing and the content of a commercial radio station. So let's look at community. So for community radio station, we do generally have staff at community radio stations. But not all community radio stations have staff. Some community radio stations in Canada operate on like $500 a year. So not enough to pay staff to work for them. Uh, and it's basically completely volunteer run. Most campus radio stations like CIVL will have some full-time staff or some part-time staff. At CIVL, we have two full-time and a number of part-time staff members. Uh, at the oldest and most successful campus radio stations in Canada, you'll have between five to eight full-time staff members at Calgary, the University of Guelph, uh, UBC. They all have at least three to five different full-time staff members, uh, maybe a promotions director and a volunteer coordinator and a programming manager and a technical coordinator. And all these people have full-time jobs. At CIVL, we have, I'm a station manager. We have a program manager who's a co-op student that changes every semester, every every year, depending on how many terms the co-op student uses. And then we have a part-time music director. We have part-time newscasters and other part-time roles on occasion. So that's how the staffing looks. We're not, uh, that's how the staffing looks. The staff are responsible for doing what we're doing now, training, uh, doing outreach, uh, recruiting folks and supervising and facilitating for them to engage on the radio with the content that is important to them, irrespective of how profitable it might be or how popular it might be. The idea is that we're activating and providing agency to individuals and groups that don't have those opportunities on commercial radio. So the staff's job is to activate and support volunteers at a community radio station. Question. Uh, with the rise of Spotify and SoundCloud, have you seen numbers take a hit? Or... The que okay, so the que if we can't hear the question, yeah, with Spotify, SoundCloud, everything's online, podcasting, yeah. do people even want to produce radio? Yeah. So like what we've seen, I don't know about specifically based on that. Right. What I know is that across the sector, community and campus radio in Canada, stations have experienced about a 40% drop in engagement right. to volunteers since covid specifically since covid yeah. right now asking if you're asking me who i've been working in community campus radio for 20 years now um and here specifically for for now 13 years um yes uh, people are less interested in being on the radio they're less interested in listening to the radio obviously there's more people listening to spotify yeah. uh there's more listen people listening to podcasts in general but so, for instance, at CIBL, that's why we made sure that our new website uh, will log every program, will allow us to subscribe to those podcasts automatically. So it's essentially, if you want to put together a podcast, you can do that by hosting your show at CIBL. It will be a podcast. Okay. Yeah, there's also been the rise of a uh, satellite. Radio. Satellite radio, XM and Sirius radio have have that's that's been going on for like 15 years now. Oh, Keep see. in mind, CIBL has been podcasting. We've had RSS feeds since 2008. So this is something that we've known with technology growing is going to impact the sector. It doesn't necessarily have to draw away from the sector, but I think our challenge is to let people know that, well, if you want to put together a podcast, doing a weekly radio show, technically well, long before podcasts ever existed, somebody coming into a campus or a community radio station and doing their hour a week 
on air, that's that's basically the same format as a podcast, um, as opposed to you know the, the the traditional radio jock who who does their you know nine, six a.m. to ten a.m. slot every morning uh, on commercial radio or their you know their afternoon drive their three to six afternoon drive slot on commercial radio. Um, people would come in once a week for an hour, maybe two hours. That's more similar to the podcast uh, format that we know. Of course, there are daily podcasts that are produced by all sorts of different groups. CBC has them. The Globe and Mail has them. Uh, Democracy Now! is a, uh, an American program, news program, that does a podcast of their radio program every day. And they're, ca they're carried on many campus radio stations and community radio stations. So doesn't really give you an answer so much to that question, but it but it kind of gives a broader picture of what's happening. Right. Um, so, yeah, we'd love for people to put together podcasts that we air. If you call them a podcast, fine. I think everything we do on the radio is ostensibly a podcast here. We can make it a podcast and we provide you with the facility, the studio, the tools and the broadcast mechanism um, to, to share your podcast. Um, good question. And it's a little more about that content, right? So the staff are facilitating for volunteers to put together that content. Sometimes staff do their own programming as well. Uh, but the content is reflective of those individual volunteers. I, as a staff member, no other staff member will be telling you, you have to program this kind of content. You're coming to me with your ideas. Maybe not you as individuals, but some individuals will come and they'll say, I want to do a surf show a show about surfing or a show about mountain climbing or a show about uh, punk music or a show about K-pop music or whatever it is. And it's our responsibility as staff to help you do that. And that's all based on what your interest is, which is basically the opposite of commercial radio where, okay, you may decide you'll apply for a job at a country station because you want to play country music uh, or announce country music, but the bosses are going to be telling you which country songs and you know, give you very strict parameters of what you say about those songs. You won't be able to talk politics uh, however you like, unless it aligns exactly with what ownership is looking for. Um, and we can see examples in the in the commercial realm where uh, on-air jocks have gotten in trouble for branching out uh, from what ownership wants. And that isn't to say that there's nothing you can do on community radio that you'll be told you can't. There are rules and regulations you have to follow through with. But by and large, at CIVL and most campus community radio stations, we regulate for you to stick within the broader Canadian government regulations. Um, and that's about it. As long as you're following the rules and then the rules we implement here at our station in order to make it so that we can follow through with those rules, you're, you're, you're gravy. You're doing, you're doing your job. So we've talked about personnel, volunteer at community radio, staff primarily at commercial radio, content uh, up to the volunteers, what kind of content they want to air versus commercial radio where you're kind of prescribed what you're going to air. Uh, what about the funding? If commercial radio makes their money selling advertisements to their listeners, how do campus radio stations make money? More just local sponsorships or like local advertisements. Testing. So that's one way. Local advertisements is one way. Uh, but of course, I I lifted the curtain back a little bit and showed you what the wizard is doing. And I said, no, we don't plan to sell advertising, really. So where else do you think it comes from? Uh, is there a budget from the campus? So I got two thoughts. Raymond, what were you thinking? Is there a budget from the school? So Raymond says a budget for this school. Nicholas says from student taxes. And let's put those two together because uh, technically there are not student taxes. Right. Uh, but similarly to the way, yeah, we pay taxes on everything uh, when we buy, when we uh, work, when we uh, when we when we make certain expenses or investments and things like this, we're taxed on it at the end of the year. Students don't pay taxes, so to speak. But we are student funded. Um, so, Raymond, there is a budget and it does come from student payments, but we don't look at it as a tax. We look at it as their student fees, which at UFV, there are three student fees, three organizations you'll pay student fees to. At UBC, at U of Calgary, University of Guelph, my alma mater, you'll pay student fees to a dozen or dozens of different groups, organizations. There will be a queer society and maybe, uh, you know, 
Caribbean Student Society and maybe a Christian Fellowship and so on and so forth. All sorts of different student groups will be earning a student fee every semester and generally also asking students whether or not they will fund new societies or fund active societies more than they already have, or sometimes even to fund less. Uh, at UIB, there are three specific organizations. So there's the campus radio station, that's CIBL. We take a student fee every semester. There's a campus newspaper, the Cascade Journalism Society. They take a student fee every semester. And then there's the Student Union Society, which takes a host of different student fees every semester for a number of different services they provide. In each of these fees, every time there's an individual fee, the students will have to vote on whether or not they approve of this fee. So uh, CIVL and the Cascade, we voted last, students voted last on whether, on what our funding levels would be back in 2014. Uh, the student union has implemented a couple different fees since that time, uh, and their fees were established earlier in the 90s, I think. Uh, so UFE CIBL has been taking a student fee since about 2005 is the first time students voted to approve of a student radio fee. Uh, and then they, they voted again in 2014 to, to increase that fee. Uh, so we've been at the same level since 2014 for the last 10 years. Um, does that answer the question of student fees, Raymond, Nicholas? Is that pretty clear? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So let this be uh, a, a notice that if there are new services that you think the university or students at the university uh, would benefit from, uh, there are ways to implement uh, structurally new organizations and then to lobby the students to agree or disagree to fund those initiatives. Um, keep that in mind. I'm always happy to talk about those initiatives. I think we need more of them at UFV. Um, yeah. Uh, of course, there's there's lots of debate on that. Should students be paying over and above what their tuition is and this and that? So those are those are issues that uh, are further merit discussion at times, right? Um, any other questions about that? The funding, the personnel, the content. So there's also there's also community stations that are not associated with a campus in particular in the student body, so they don't get the student fees. And so how do they? You mentioned one. Jack, the, uh, the, the, the sponsorships and small business advertising, right? So that is a huge piece of what commercial, sorry, of what community radio stations do. And as a result, in order to attract that kind of advertising and sponsorship, community stations are actually allowed to play more top 40 hits than just the 10% that campuses are allowed to. They still don't play very many, uh, but they're allowed to play more. And so sponsorship, advertising, another way, what other ways can we think of them being funded community stations that aren't at a university? Um, they could be like um, provincially or municipality funded. So depending on where you are, where you live, maybe the municipality is interested in funding. Um, uh, maybe the, pro pro the provinces. So the province, one particular way that stations get community stations, and there's one campus station I know who does this, the University of Victoria actually gets BC gaming funds. So when you buy the lottery or when there's a 50-50 draw somewhere, uh, the government takes fees, payments, all sorts of taxes off of this and redistributes those funds into uh, environment projects, public safety projects, uh, sports, local sport initiatives, and also arts and culture projects. So uh, the University of Victoria's radio station, CFUV, they get BC gaming money every year. It's operational funding for them to be able to uh, supplement their income and, and operate in their community. There's a community station in Smithers, BC, which is a small community station, which does also get uh, annual BC gaming funds. So that is one uh, available option. There aren't a lot of stations that do that, but broadly, government grants are one way that community stations will be funded, uh, whether it's provincial or federal or municipal. So all, all, all three of those, those levels are potential ways that stations can get funding. Um, but primarily community stations will be advertising, looking for sponsorship uh, and fundraising, just straight fundraising. The kind of, are we all familiar with the, 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 the public television telethon style? There's, uh, you know, operators are waiting to take your call, make your donation today. Uh, the telethon style uh, fundraising uh, mechanism. Most campus and community radio stations will do that every year for at least a week, where everybody who has a show 
every couple songs is saying, okay, hope you like that music. Now it's time. $50 donation will get you a mug. $100 donation will get you a mug and a t-shirt. And $150 will, I'll program my whole show for you next week if you make that contribution. Uh, so most community stations will rely on those kinds of functions. At CIBL, we ran one such fundraising drive in 2013. The goal was to earn money that would go towards uh, our expansion to Chilliwack. So at CIBL, we started broadcasting on 1017 FM in Abbotsford and Mission that does not serve Chilliwack. Chilliwack is where one third of the UFE students who pay the student fee are. Uh, so starting in 2013, we started raising money so that we could do the work to get to Chilliwack, which as of this recording, we are currently testing in Chilliwack on 92.3 FM. So we've completed, or we're about to complete that, that long-term capital investment where we save money, uh, fundraise, and, uh, and and did other initiatives in order to get us towards that Chilliwack broadcast. So that's been a long-term project of ours. Um, and uh, but 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 at this time we have not done further fundraising drives, and we may in the future, but we have not yet. Any other questions about campus versus community radio? Um, when you like expand to other places, is it like? you have to pay like just one lump sum and you get mm. um, some more bandwidth there or is it like you have to pay over time? So we don't, so you don't, the, the frequencies are not, if, if I have a radio station, uh, the government can approve for me to trade my frequency with another station or to sell that frequency with another station. We'll talk about one station that did that at one point, but the government itself doesn't charge you to have the frequency. So the government asks you to make an application, like I described, what impact will you make financially on the community? They also ask, more importantly, really is, so what are your technical parameters when you operate on this new frequency? Where will you be broadcasting from? Where will your tower and antenna be? How will that spread throughout the community? What is the infrastructure around that look like? What are the technical pieces of it? Um, that's what they're most concerned of. Is there space on the frequency? Is there room for you to serve this community? If you were a commercial station, they'd want to know, well, what commercial radio stations are there in their, in your community and how will you impact them? There's already a hard rock station, so I'm not going to approve your hard rock station. How are you different from that hard rock station? What different kinds of advertisers are you going to sell to? If CFOX is, let's just say, it's a hard rock station in Vancouver, it's selling it, it advertises, you know, trucks and boots and beers and their their demographic is a 34 to 46 year old guy trending, skewing demographic, perhaps. Right. To gender it and and and, uh, and be normative about it. Uh, then let's say the peak was a newer radio station that was playing rock music. It's, it's not doing so anymore, uh, but it was. And when it was new, they would have been asked when they applied for their frequency to be the peak, they would have been asked. So we've got a rock station at Fox. How are you different? And the peak said, well, we're world-class rock. We're a little softer rock. We're a little indie rock. We're skewing probably more towards women than the Fox was, more towards younger folk than the Fox was. Maybe we're advertising instead of boots, beers, and, uh, and trucks, we're advertising more. And again, this is very gendered, but that's the world of demographics. Um, we, we, we're skewing more towards, you know, uh, travel and vacations and maybe like I've heard on the peak, a lot of hair removal advertisements and, uh, you know, uh, uh, coolers and things like this instead of the beers. So that's looking at what kind of impact they'd make in the market, but you're not paying for the frequency. You're just pro proving that you'll add to the, to the uh, general environment of radio in your area. So for CIVL to expand, we had to make applications to the government that said, this is where we'll broadcast from. This is what area we'll reach. This is what kind of, um, this, is, this is where our antenna will be and how it will impact the radio market as a whole. Uh, but it's not necessarily, spent. It's, it's expensive, but it's expensive because of the equipment and the engineering work and the labor that goes into establishing your station rather than expensive because you have to buy the frequency or anything like that. Now, if another commercial entity wants to want, thinks my frequency is better than theirs, they can offer you money for it. That's up to you. But they could also tell you to give it to you for free. And if you agreed, then the government would say, okay, trade it. Go for it. Uh, CIVL traded frequencies. Before we were 101.7, we were supposed to be 88.5. 
but you now hear CBC on 88.5 because we traded frequencies. It's called the frequency swap. Uh, and that was mutually beneficial to CBC and CIVL, which is why that happened. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions about the first couple of things that we've talked about here? No? Okay. So that's a little bit about the background of community and campus radio in Canada uh, and how it differs from commercial radio. The next thing we'll talk about is the National Campus and Community Radio Association. Now, what on earth, what on earth is that? Does anybody have ideas? Raymond, you look deep in thought. No, no, never no, heard of it. It's first time. Fair enough. Is it specifically to fund campus radios? So it's specifically for campus and community radio, but it's not to fund them per se. So again, we get our funding from student fees, primarily, and other sources as well. Community stations get their funding from, like I mentioned, grants, fundraising, advertising, sponsorship, uh, these different pieces. So no, not, not, it's not there to fund us, but it's there to support us for sure, specifically for campus and community radio stations. So the way I describe it is they're like a guild or even a union. OK, if you're a plumber or an electrician, you may have uh, or you probably are required to have membership in like the B.C. Plumbers Guild or Association or, you know, you're accredited depending on what your professional uh, role is. Right. Doctors have to be approved by the provincial medical authority uh, association and whatnot. Um, so some of these are regulatory bodies. Others more in the guild arena uh, than in the accreditory arena uh, would be more to skill develop. And, you know, in the U case of a union, it'll be uh, the people who work at a specific or in a specific role at a specific, either a specific location or company or for different companies where they all have similar relationships with their employers. The union will fight for the rights of the, of the employer and will look at uh, advocating on behalf of the, sorry, of the employee, not the employer. And we'll advocate to the employer that, you know, conditions need to be improved or wages need to be raised or, you know, the, here are some conflicts among staff or between staff and employers that need to be addressed. Um, and in this sense, we look at the NCRA as, again, a guild of community and campus radio stations. So they will, I describe it as two general functions that they provide of advocacy and lobbying. Sorry, advocacy and support is really what I say. So advocacy looks like lobbying. Uh, lobbying is when, you know, the oil sector or the energy sector or the tobacco sector or the milk sector or the dairy sector really, or all these other different groups or vocations or businesses will have, will, they will pay for lobbyists. These people are named called lobbyists who are uh, re registered with the government and their job is to convince legislators and the staff of legislators to make legislation that benefits the dairy interests, the blueberry farmers' interests, the oil companies' interests, the tobacco, all sorts. Um, and so the NCRA actually also does lobbying on behalf of community and campus radio stations. So they pay for registered lobbyists to advocate to legislators on our behalf. These things would be better for campus community radio. The rules could be changed this or that way that would uh, alleviate burdens, that would uh, allow for more funding or more access or more support for these stations. So that is one significant role of the NCRA is to lobby government, lobby um, in general, not necessarily only federal government or provincial government, but work with other industries, whether it's the advertising sector, uh, maybe it's the broadcast sector itself coming up with tools that would benefit community campus radio. Uh, that's one role of the NCRA. But we're going to look at their website now. We're going to talk all about some of the functions they provide. So uh, here we go to the old website of the National Campus Community Radio Association. They have a new website, but I like some of the, fun some of the uh, features of the old website. So for instance, we can see here they have little dots for all the different stations in Canada. And it's not actually all of them, but it's a good chunk of them. So if we hover over a dot, we'll see 
What station is there? CILU Thunder Bay at Laurentian University in Thunder Bay. Or is that Lakehead? I think maybe that's Lakehead. Uh, let's take a step back for a second and say how many stations, how many radio stations do we think there are in Canada as a whole, community and commercial stations? Quite a bit. <laughs> um, Get, throw out a number. Um, 50? 250? 50, 250. Raymond, what do you think? Um, Almost a thousand. Yeah, it's actually, so Raymond, uh, Price is Right rules. Are we all familiar with Price is Right rules? You, the closest without going over is the winner. Raymond wins Price is Right rules right now. RIP Bob Barker. It's only been a week or two since he died. Um, yeah, there's about 12, 1300 uh, radio stations as a whole in Canada. And when you think about it, you know, 11 provinces, three territories, uh, it's about 100 stations per per parcel of territory or province. Um, you think about, you know, a large city like Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, that's probably going to have at least like 10 radio stations there. Um, now, of those, you know, 12, 1300 stations in Canada, how many of them do you think are commercial versus community-based radio stations? Now, the community-based radio stations include the campus-based radio stations. But how many do you think are commercial? at least 90 percent of the radio stations 90 percent okay we'll go with percentages you guys want to take a shot the other two i mean i think uh, community radios would usually boil down to like universities and like maybe uh, churches but like that so generally churches will will have uh churches and other other faith-based uh institutions will have their own license actually like a uh it's a, a religious license um so they don't uh, they're not covered under community radio and i guess they're probably also not included in the 1300 okay. um so they're probably more although maybe it's only 100 or so in canada i'm not sure how many there actually are um but so 90 percent from jack raymond you want to take a stab at it how many uh commercial versus community stations out of the 1300 or so uh let's say two-thirds two-thirds is commercial two-thirds commercial so we're, we're basically going to split the difference between Jack and Raymond. It's about, so there's about 300 or some odd community radio stations in Canada, leaving about 900 or so. So, uh, you know, by my numbers, it's about 75%, right, is commercial. So right in between where Jack and Raymond were suggesting there. Um, if I was keeping score with the prices right rules, I guess Raymond is two, two and, uh, and, and we all lose. Okay. Uh, but uh, so, yeah. Most of them are commercial stations. So let's look at it a little more granularly. So if there's about 300 community stations as a whole, how many of those do you think are campus stations? So you said you think most of them are probably based in campuses, most of the community stations. So we think there are 100 plus campus radio stations in Canada. Does that sound right to everybody? Yeah? Yeah. So Price is Right rules is wrong. There's there's like just under, I think there's, we, I believe, are the 49th campus radio station in Canada. So that means there's about two, 250 community stations that aren't associated with uh, with, with a campus. Um, yeah, and CIVL uh, going live in 2010 on FM, that was, I think, the 49th. So, and there has not been another campus station since. Um, so we are the youngest, we are the newest, um, we are also the only one who's a campus station to have multiple frequencies now in multiple communities, um, which is an interesting and I think historic development on behalf of civil radio and the UFE students. Um, so yeah, basically every major university in Canada does have a campus radio station. Uh, there are some exceptions and I'll go over those right now. Every province, for instance, has at least two or three campus radio stations. You can see there's two in Saskatchewan, one in Regina, one in Saskatoon. Neither of these stations in Saskatchewan are on campus. Neither of them are campus stations. I think one of them used to be and moved off campus, changed their, their regulations. Um, PEI, the smallest province in Canada, I think that's it right here, uh, PEI does not have a campus nor community radio station. So UPEI thus is a, a relatively large university in Canada that doesn't have a campus radio station. So you got UPEI, 
University of Saskatchewan, University of uh, Regina. Um, whereas in Winnipeg, there are two campus stations, one at University of Manitoba, one at University of Winnipeg. There's also one in Brandon at the University of Brandon, CJJ. Most of the campus radio stations we can see are in Southern Ontario, where, mo where most of the people are, most of the community in campus radio stations, that is. Most of the people are in Southern Ontario. A lot of people in the Lower Mainland here, so a lot of a lot of campus and community radio stations in the Lower Mainland as well. Uh, and there's at least one each in each of the territories, although they're not shown here on the on the map. So, for instance, Whitehorse in the Yukon has CJUC. When COVID hit, we were scheduled to go for the annual campus radio conference, campus community radio conference in Whitehorse, Yukon. Uh, but those plans had to be changed because of the pandemic. Uh, so, but they, well, they were going to be descended upon by 100 people from all over Canada. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't happen. It was going to be in June. That would have been 23 hours of sunlight in Whitehorse. I was really looking forward to experiencing that. Uh, maybe one day. Uh, okay. Oh, so for instance, here's an example of a community radio station, CFBS, that also has two frequencies in uh i believe that's newfoundland and then here cjl oh, where's cjly cjly kootenai co-op radio also has multiple frequencies in Nels the nelson area because of how hilly and again they're nestled inside the mountains so they need multiple frequencies to serve their multiple communities there and uh, I don't know if I'll be able to find it here, C C G L Y. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about the landscape in Canada of community campus radio stations as a whole. Going back to what the NCRA does, so not all of these stations are required to be members of the NCRA. It is a voluntary membership group. Uh, they do charge membership. They generally, they cap it at like a couple grand a year for membership, but otherwise it's a percentage of your income. Um, and yeah, so we pay them to provide the services. They have an office in Ottawa. They have staff, full-time staff there that work on behalf of the members. Um, and we're going to look at all the different types of services they provide. So first off, they do listener surveys. Um, and the data that I'm showing here, they've done data since, but they do the data for uh, what the audience for campus community radio looks like in Canada. Uh, as of 2017, this is the numbers we have here. Uh, but still in within what I would call the podcast era, 2017. And it tells us, it depends on how you read this content, but what it tells us is if 61% of people don't listen to campus radio, period, it still leaves about 39% of people that in one way or another do. So that, uh, to be honest, that, that sounds actually not too bad, that there's 40% of people in Canada who on occasion will be listening to campus radio. Sure, only 5% are doing it regularly across the country, but... 20% of them at least are doing it once in a while. Another 14 are doing it here and there. Put that all together. Yeah, that's 40,000, 40% 40 of the people in Canada that are listening to campus radio once in a while. So that could be as high as like 15 million people, technically. Um, you'd have to look for more granulated data. Uh, and they, they break this data down along all sorts of different uh, categories, according to age, according to gender, according to where folks were born, whether they're immigrants or not. I thought that's interesting. Where they are in different provinces. Where they are. Are they urban, suburban, or rural? What's their household income like? Do they have college or university education or not? How active are they? What's their political leaning? which actually I think is kind of interesting. What party they vote for specifically? Are they a visible minority or not? What's their employment status? So, and on and on and on, the NCRA has looked into these, these data points. Um, and I think that's valuable for the sector as a whole that they do so. Just shows that they're they're doing research on behalf of uh, campus community radio stations and trying to provide us with the tools to sell ourselves if we want for more partnerships, more listenership, more advertising, these kinds of pieces. The NCRA also, if we're a member, they collect advertising from national advertisers. 
So they'll go to somebody who has a national advertising campaign they're looking to do, and they'll say, we represent stations all across the country. We'll sell you a bulk batch of advertising at all these different stations, and then we'll go to those individual stations and say, CIVL, are you willing to play these amounts of ads for this amount of money? Um, but they do the legwork for us, and we just have to play that content. So they're providing a service for us there that can uh, subsidize our operations. Question? I'm um, curious why someone would want to run a community radio if they're not part of a campus, because it, it technically doesn't generate revenue. Right. Much. Well, I mean, why would somebody want to be involved in any community organization right. or nonprofit? So there are different motivations depending on where you are. Right. In a rural community, let's say, I mean, if you're in a rural community, uh, let's say you're like halfway up yeah. the entire province of BC, there are probably limited amount of ways to connect to people across yeah. the wide, va vast uh, yeah. properties of your community, right? So finding out like information about people or initiatives in that community, yeah. spreading awareness and information. Not everybody goes to the same websites yeah. all the time. Like I would assume a radio station is fairly expensive to set up as well. It's expensive, so, yes. Yeah. So you, you need a committed group of people. You need funding sources. Yeah. And the government, before they approve your station, will look, will ask, where's your money coming from? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's an endeavor. Um, I can't speak to necessarily the motivations beyond – you know, my own biased perspective of thinking campus and community radio is like a really important cultural force in yeah. Canada um, and could be in other places and is in other places. Uh, in Australia, there are, there's really good work being done there uh, from community radio stations that focuses on prisoner justice. So uh, doing content that reinforces that, you know, prisoners are people and that people in the correction system need their rights attended to, right? Maybe we've heard in the Trump indictment uh, saga, if we followed that at all, that, oh, Fulton County Jail has horrible uh, circumstances, horrible environment. It's not humane for people to be there. That's been a topic. And so that issue is motivating of some people in Australia who are involved in community radio. People in Canada have certain right. similar interests. And then if, like, let's say a company like Tim Hortons mm -hmm. decided to open up a radio, mm -hmm. Technically, would that fall under community radio? Because they it, might be planning on just advertising their own products. So, I mean, it would depend. Yeah, it would depend on what con content they they, they would want to do. For, uh, Raymond, are you hearing the question from, from Nicholas here? Yes. So, so yeah, if Tim Hortons, again, it, it, it depends on what uh, on what their interest is. Right. Yeah, if they wanted to run an advertisement for Tim Hortons yeah. radio station, uh, the government would consider that as it is. It's a commercial radio station. Now, if Tim Hortons wanted to be the funder of a community radio station that operated as a community radio station. You know, perhaps they could start a charity and the charity would start a nonprofit and the nonprofit would get a radio station and the charity would fund the radio station. And Tim Hortons would get tax write offs for the yeah. investment they make in the charity that would donate their money to the radio station that would fund those operations. But of course, that nonprofit operation of the radio station would have to be nonprofit, yeah. would have to invest what they earn back into the organization. Maybe they wouldn't earn at all yeah. and they would just keep it going and it wouldn't be Tim Hortons advertising necessarily. But why would they be considered a commercial radio if they're paying out of their own pocket to fund the station? Well, everybody's paying their own, out of their own pocket to fund a station if it's commercial right. radio. Oh, it's just you're turning a profit after you make that investment, right? Right. But the profit's not coming into the radio station more so the company where it's selling their so it's the it's the focus of the content really that the government will will legislate based okay. upon right it's it's are you programming uh for popularity for mainstream interests in which case you'd be a commercial station if you're programming that i mean look the 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 unique factor of the community radio station is the volunteer engagement right um, so let's say tim hortons uh, let's look at it a different way yeah Tim Hortons starts a radio, maybe their community radio station focuses on specifically talking about coffee. Maybe it's a coffee radio station. Right. So it's sponsored by Tim Hortons. But like, what are we talking? We're talking about Arabica versus other types yeah. of beans. And we're talking about like farming and how you farm and like different practices in right. doing that and collecting and what the international market of coffee looks like. You know, Tim Hortons does a lot of promotion of their camp days, uh, youth involvement, 
and working with like collectives in South America to buy more ethical beans and things like this. And maybe that's what the content's focused on. And they're funding this radio station so that people can come in and volunteer to do that content. The, the hybrid model you suggest is very unique. It's, a, it's an outlier. Uh, so this is my attempt at answering that question. Yeah. But yeah, generally it's based on the engagement of the community, the accessibility of the resource, um, and the and the variety of information that's being shared, I think. Right. Does, that, right. does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've, okay, we've talked a little bit about the advertising from the NCRA, the listener numbers they put together. Here's information about their, their Canadian ads uh, program where they try to develop more of those national ads to, to share with different stations to do more of that legwork. They have here a tome of a web page, and this is what UFE students would have gone to back in about 2003 or four. They would have said, well, I want to start a campus community radio station. How do I do it? And then they would have read through all of this. Why Campus Community Radio? Bringing marginalized voices to the airwaves and highlighting Canadian artists in your locality. That's what the NCRA defines as the reason that you would start campus radio. What's the mandate? It guarantees local broadcasting services through community ownership, which means the community stations cannot be privately purchased or for profit by a for profit organization. It permits and facilitates communication among members of the community, fostering diverse diversity in the broadcast of opinions and spoken word and political and musical programming. Participates in the stimulation of the local economy, endeavors and uh, in the cultural enrichment of communities and reflects the diversity of the community served. So those are the focuses. If Jim Hortons wants to contribute to that, they can, but those operations would have to be arm's length from, from their commercial efforts. Um, but so anyway, the, this page takes us through. It explains a little bit about Type B native broadcasts, religious licenses, which you asked about, some developmental licenses for stations that aren't necessarily ready to be full-time broadcasters, specifically ethnic stations. We have uh, Red FM 93.1 based in Surrey uh, that specifically serves Punjabi uh, language content. And there are all, all of these different uh, sectors are, are regulated slightly differently. But so somebody wanted to start a new station would go to the NCRA and they would read through this content. They'd follow up on some of these links. They'd also probably call the office and say, hey, Barry, who is the, the executive director now, walk me through, tell me what I need to know that I'm not already thinking about and starting a radio station. Uh, so that's a that's a primary focus of the NCRA is helping you start a new radio station. Now, many many community radio stations have started in the last 13 years since CIBL started, uh, but no new campus stations have gotten off the ground. Toronto Metropolitan University it used to be called Ryerson. They were actually one of the first broadcasters in Toronto, and they were the first campus broadcaster in Toronto. They lost their license in 2011 for a variety of reasons we won't get into here. And then the students started up a new AM radio station uh, within the last five to eight years to replace that old station. So that student body lost and regained a radio station since CIVL started. I tend to not count them because it's the same student fee they're yeah. taking and this and that and the other, but uh, not to take anything away with the people who established that radio station. And we partnered with them. We actually built our websites together, uh, CJRU 1280 AM. So you'll notice if you go to the websites, they look exactly the same because we we developed our websites at the same time with the same provider um, in cooperation. Setting up a campus station, done. Uh, another really valuable service that the NCRA provides is their listservs. So we're in touch, I'm in touch. My inbox is full every day of different messages through the NCRA. Uh, people communicating, either the staff from the NCRA, board from the NCRA, or people, volunteers and staff members from other stations around the country uh, on a variety of different topics. And so a listserv is basically like a Google group, or it's like a Slack chat, basically. Um, but it shows up in your email, and there are different uh, topics for each listserv. So if I send an email, if once I've registered, if you're a, you're a volunteer, you can register to any one of these lists if you like, and then you'll be updated with all the emails that get sent to NCRA members. 
and all the questions and discussion that takes place there. If we were on the Atlantic list, if we were on the Atlantic side of Canada, we could participate in the, we probably can't anyway, but the, the, the relevance would be low. Uh, but so different groups for Atlantic stations, Quebec stations, Ontario stations, Northern stations, Prairie stations, Pacific stations. There's a list for community stations, a list for campus stations, a list for Aboriginal or Indigenous stations. There's a sales list, a fundraising list, a list for programming, a list for music, a list for volunteers, a list for women, a list for gender and sexual minorities, a technical list, a news list, and an earshot list. And we'll talk about what earshot is in a little bit. But the idea being, if you're a technical volunteer, you can participate in the technical list. And if you have a technical question that the staff and board at your station can't answer, you'll send it out to the other technical people from the NCRA. And so maybe CIVL will ask a question, and Halifax will answer it. And then Winnipeg will see that answer from Halifax and they'll say, hey, Halifax, I agree. That is a good way to fix that piece of equipment. However, only in the short term. If you do it for more than five years, the equipment blows up. Instead, do it like this. And then Winnipeg, through Abbotsford asking a question, helps Halifax and Abbotsford both refine their technical operations. It's a crude example. Right, so this is a bit unrelated, but uh, technically, community radios, because they're funded by the community and they're helped a bit by the government and unions, technically, they would be operating at a loss, right? No nonprofit wants to operate at a loss. Yes. All of them need to reinvest their earnings. Yeah. I wouldn't say they're funded by unions and government in any way that's necessarily different than campus stations. The difference is that we have built in student bodies that are funding, but we all may go after the same funding. They just are allowed to do more advertising. Yeah, yeah. so it's the advertising that helps them like try to break even, but like they're not really allowed to turn a profit because then that would turn them into a commercial radio, right? So when you're talking about nonprofits and turning a profit, like if, if a nonprofit makes a hundred thousand more dollars next year, that's okay. They just have to invest it back into the organization, oh, nice. right? So they're not trying, you're not trying to lose money, right. but you're trying to break even as a whole. Yeah. Uh, well, you're allowed to save money, yep. but the difference is, so the ownership, maybe, maybe this will help because ownership is a, a, I own a station. I'm a multimillionaire. I want to pay people to run and operate my station and pay for all the capital and equipment. When they make profit, I get to keep it. The ownership of a nonprofit is its volunteer board of directors. So that volunteer board of directors, nobody ever makes money off of that station. That's for all nonprofits and charities. Some individual charity or nonprofit board members are allowed to make money sometimes under certain circumstances. Usually when they're contributing, if I'm like an accountant that sits on a nonprofit board of directors, that, that, that society can pay me to do their books, let's say. But otherwise, I'm not, if we make an extra million dollars next year as a nonprofit, none of the board members can pocket that money. So that's the difference between for-profit and non-profit broadly. And that's across all sectors. All right. Does that, does that make a little more sense? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the listserv is a way that we can all engage um, on these different topics. If it's a technical, I just kind of explain crudely how, how we might we talk about uh, technical pieces. But let's say the fundraising list, you know, a new board member, um, to a, to a campus radio station may ask that very specific question, let's say, if nobody is there to answer that question at their station, and they'll send it to the fundraising list. Hey, guys, uh, I have a plan to make $500,000 next year in our fundraising drive. Does that make us a for-profit station? And then somebody will respond on the list that'll say, hey, this is how that works. It's not like that. Um, and then we're all a party to that discussion. Sometimes those discussions will be around Bill C-18 or Bill C-11, which is legislation right now, that's stopping news uh, from being shared on Facebook or Instagram in Canada. Uh, and so there's lots of discussion about that and lots of disagreement about that. Sometimes it's about, uh, you know, how do we properly acknowledge indigenous groups at our radio stations or among NCRA stations? And there'll be maybe disagreement or agreement on those. Um, so that's just to say that we're connected to all these different stations. There are hundreds and hundreds of people on these lists and we can participate and get involved in that as well. So that's the listserv. And let's go back to conferences. So I mentioned briefly the conference earlier. 
uh, every year. And the conference actually predates the NCRA itself. So the first conference was 40 something years ago. I think it was like 1984, 1980. Oh, here we go. 1981 was the first conference. And I believe it was later that year that the NCRA established as an organization. But in 1981, for the first time in Ottawa, campus community radio stations in Canada came together. And they've done so almost every single year since um, at a different place in the country. In Abbotsford, we actually hosted in 2017, which meant that for a week uh, in Everett Hall, directly across the building from us, uh, for one whole week, there were 115 different people from all across the country. Most of them stayed at uh, Lalem to Baker, the, the residence building on campus. Uh, so the university made $20,000 hosting all those people from all across the country, charging them to stay at Baker House. Um, uh, and we scheduled a week's worth of programming. So lectures, workshops, uh, different events and musical presentations, and also uh, an award show where we uh, recognize the best in campus community radio. Um, so generally, these days, it's about a three-day event uh, with evening keynote speeches and different uh, celebrations, uh, generally uh, opportunities for people to visit lo different locations in town, get to know the different places you're in. Uh, so like I said, we were going to go to Whitehorse. This past June, we went to Calgary. Uh, the next two conferences will be in Cape Breton next year, uh, and it'll be uh, after that in Nanaimo, I believe. Uh, there's also a station manager summit where people in management um, gather once a year. So I went to Ottawa for that last year, and that was valuable for the station. I made some connections with government officials that were helpful for a tower. Um, so that's a bit about the conference. The idea about the conference is through the listserv, uh, and you don't have to participate in the listserv to get engaged with this, but I, as a station manager, will receive a call out, let's say in January or February, and it'll say, hey, Cape Breton is seeking your input for next year's, for this coming conference in five months. And so I'll have the opportunity, as will the volunteers, to say, well, I'd like to be receiving these training sessions at the conference. Or maybe you think you can lead a training session. Uh, I'd like to lead a session that talks about the business of nonprofit radio. Maybe it seems like you're interested in that, right? Or Raymond, you're interested in the technical pieces. Raymond wants to lead a session uh, about teching for campus radio. Uh, or maybe you want to just participate in a workshop or a roundtable with other people and share and exchange ideas and foster discussion. Um, or maybe, again, you want to be receiving leadership on different topics that you want to enrich yourself in. So we get a chance to help prepare and plan or at least provide input into the, how the conference works in advance. Um, but also students can go and present at these conferences. So then you have on your resume, hey, I, I made a presentation as part of a delegation to the National Campus Community Radio Association. 50 people came to my workshop uh, and we talked about this and that and the other. These are good re resume pieces, experience building, good networking opportunities to be there and whatnot. Uh, generally, they're also available in hybrid form. There's also funding to send volunteers. Sometimes we'll send volunteers, CIVL will fund volunteers to go. Also, uh, the, the NCRA offers supportive funding as well to attend those conferences. So uh, that's a little bit about the conference every year. We used to, at the conference, also elect the board of directors of the NCRA itself. Uh, that happens at a different time of year now. Every nonprofit will have to have an annual general meeting or an AGM where they set their budget, change any bylaws that are necessary in that year. Uh, and also elect their board of directors for the year. And so that that happens over the summer, not exactly at the same time as the conference. It used to be at the conference, but we've separated it from the conference in the last few years. But so that's another opportunity, board of directors membership at the NCRA um, to be part of the, the decision-making body that's responsible and that is the ownership of the NCRA, which is another, I think, resume piece, experience building, networking opportunity that I think is valuable. There are lawyers on that board, accountants on that board, just radio professionals who have been doing it for decades. Uh, so valuable people to get in touch with. And you can make a contribution to the sector significantly. There's a job board on the NCRA website. So you may wonder, Aaron, what are you doing in Abbotsford? Well, I saw a job posting long ago. Uh, here it is. 
December 2010, or yeah, June 2010, they posted for a job. And look, we can see what this what the what the job posting said. It said, here are the qualifications. Oh, it didn't say very much, did it? Um yeah, it really didn't say very much of anything now that I look at it. Uh, but so we're able to see here what different stations are looking for in terms of staff members, what qualifications are expected, what requirements are there for the job. So if we want work in the sector, this is a place to look to see. We can see who's hiring right now in Campus Community Radio. So some of these jobs are full-time permanent. Some of them are part-time. Some of them are really temporary. This one is contract work. If you're a technical person, you could apply for the chief technical op op uh, officer job at the NCRA. Applications have just recently closed, but they were hiring somebody for, uh, I can't remember what the numbers were. Yeah, for like $20,000 for part-time work uh, for a year to, to work on the technical pieces. So that's a kind of operation or opportunity that, that gets offered on this job board. But also full-time permanent jobs like mine are offered at different stations. What's this one here for community outreach at CHMA posted two weeks ago? Applications have also closed for this. The role was supposed to start in 2023, but it was a one-year contract position with a salary of $35,000 and 35 hours a week expected. So we can see what, what different opportunities there are out there uh, if we're interested in it. This is a grant position. So they applied for a grant. The grant's hire, offered for them to hire somebody for $35,000. So I think it's really valuable in terms of looking at what jobs are looking for and what I have to develop in terms of my experience and my qualifications to be eligible for those jobs. Maybe you're not interested in jobs in that in the sector uh, in the long term, but it can also be resume building and developing. Um, and CIVL hires through this mechanism uh, regularly when we get grant hires as well. Okay. Talked a little bit about the Community Radio Awards. Every year, uh, there are uh, there is an awards show, and every year, CIVL staff put time into submitting content that volunteers have produced on your here uh, to win awards. So this past year, we won the Sports Award, and we won the Hip Hop Award. Uh, previously, we've won about 12 different, 13 different uh, awards at the NCRA over the years. And another cool thing that if you win an, an award for your radio content, that's exciting. We get awards, we go to an award show, we give a speech, it's fun stuff. Generally, the Calgary station cleans up like every single year. This year, there were like 35 awards, they won 16 awards. They're also the host of the conference. When we hosted the conference, we also won more awards than anybody else, but we only won four. And I don't know if it had to do with us hosting the conference or not. Um, I'd like to think it didn't, but I definitely tried to floss and I looked like a jerk. Um, so there's also, I mentioned the board of directors uh, of the NCRA, like as a whole, the national board of directors, there's also committees. If you don't want that responsibility of being a, a national director, you could be on the finance and fundraising committee or the HR policy and governance committee or the external policy committee, which deals more with lobbying the Technical Advisory Committee, the Equity Committee, Earshot, which we're about to get to, the Indigenous Committee, or the Conference Committee. I sit on the Conference Committee. I've been a part of the Fundraising Committee for a little bit, too. Um, and again, this is an opportunity to engage at a national level with people from all across the country working on issues across province uh, that will impact all these different stations, potentially. Um, and they're always looking for more volunteer members. And it tells you here, look, what's the workload expected for this committee? Medium, high, low, to give you an idea of, of what, what's expected. And the last piece that we'll go over is earshot. So, you know, uh, music is a pretty, pretty classic uh, way that, uh, how do I, shift tab? No, this guy's not going away. Oh, there we are. So, State, obviously, we're a radio station, we play music. Uh, if you go to our website, you will see that we publish our charts on that website every week. So here's the top 10. If we click further down, we'll see 
the, there's also a top 30. So these are the songs that our music director has found gets played the most at the station. And we report this, we can see all our old charts here as well. And we report them to Earshot. So here, yeah. Um, so could we do deals with uh, upcoming musicians where they pay us to mm. play their music? So what you're at, what you're describing is a 50 year old scandal that rocked American radio in the 50s or 60s that Dick Clark from the Rockin' New Year's Eve Gala and Alan Freed, who introduced American youth to rock and roll once upon a time, got caught up into. Uh, it's called payola. You're not supposed to pay for play. So that's so that that came up in the in, in you know long ago. Um and uh the, the way and now it's a little it's it's a little outdated to think of it that way because you know, record labels and promoters are just so expansively involved in in paying for accessibility of their music. Right. But it's kind of to a degree like right now, nobody gets on a commercial radio station unless a song has been like market tested right. extra extensively to, to know that listeners will be liking what they hear and that they will stick around. So kind of muted that way. At the same time, does that mean that Taylor Swift should be played quite as often as she is? Uh you know, there's probably some promotional considerations yeah. in there. Yeah. But so the to the direct question that you're asking, are we allowed to take money to promote people? No, we are not. And as a volunteer programmer, we'll talk about it in rules and regulations. You're you're not allowed to promise somebody will get into the charts or will be charted in a certain way. And you're not allowed to trade favors for somebody to be right. programmed. You're supposed to be exhibiting your own personal discretion in terms of programming your content. Doesn't mean you can't build relationships, can't have favorites or anything like this. But no, we're not supposed to be All right. exchanging uh, any value. Right. And so because we are a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. does that technically mean we're a charity? So there's a difference between charities and nonprofits. Right. And we get to that a little later in the presentation, right. if you don't mind. Sure. Yep. Cool. But yeah, so the charts, we do report our top 30s to Earshot. Everybody reports their top 30 every week. You can see here a list of the different stations that reported this week. Here's us. So here's the top 30 for the country. Here's the top 50 for the nation. And that's made up of a conglomeration of all our top 30s. So CIVL's top 30 includes Havaya Mighty, who's currently sitting at number two. Uh, she is number one on our charts. We love her because she came and she was a headliner of when we hosted the conference in 2017. We're really proud of that because in 2019, she went on to win the Polaris Prize, the number one album in Canada. Uh, she's also been nominated for Junos. She's now like a huge starlet in the can in the Canadian um, independent and burgeoning hip hop industry. And we like to say we brought her to the MCRA first when we had her headline our conference. Um, so, yeah, great. Her new album is doing good. You can also see who else is on our charts. Stations tend to elevate local artists. Uh, because they want to promote people from their region. That's what we're here for. So Movi is high up here, fourth. Babe Corner came and played our, our local festival in the summer, Jam and Jubilee, so they're charting highly. Saint Soldier also played that festival and is a local artist. Comortals from Vancouver. She's a non-binary Filipino rapper, who I hope to see in Toronto in the next couple of weeks. With Movi, actually. They're playing together. Um, that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, and then all, all sorts of other artists here. You, it lists who's Canadian, what their record is called, what label they're on. And then you can go further in and see, oh, who who all charted this artist? And how did they chart in previous weeks? So all that information is conglomerated at earshot-online.com. Uh, different radio promoters watch these charts. Record labels watch these charts. The CBC watches these charts. Uh, music journalists watch these charts. It's something that, uh, you know, builds in, in an artist's repertoire of what they've accomplished. Um, yeah. There's also always an annual top 200. So, well, there, well, there's a monthly top 200. But yeah, there's a top 200 uh, that gets put together every year. It, the, the, the website is hosted by CJSF, so SFU's um radio station their station manager built this website and maintains it 
Yeah. So that's a huge contribution he makes to the to the sector. Yeah. So I would assume that um, if a, well, I forgot what it was called. Maybe like a studio wanted to scout prospecting artists, they would go on the site. It's one place they would look at. Yeah, totally. They'd be going to all the venues in the communities they're at, seeing what artists are playing where. Probably they'd be talking to other contacts they have in the industry, and certainly they would look who who's on earshot that I don't know right. if I'm looking for new artists, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so that's a question. there's also uh, so there's you could you could write reviews and features for Earshot if you're interested. You could uh, do interviews, uh, review records, and if we connect you with Magnus, he can help you to uh, to to be published on that website. I've done a few interviews with some artists. It's fun. It's cool to see it published there. I have a question. Specialty charts for electronic, hip hop, folk roots, blues. A lot less stations contribute to those charts. Because it means you have to have a top 10 hip hop. Maybe you only have five hip hop artists that are getting played. Um, and so not so many stations contribute to those charts, but we do have those specialty charts. Era? Raymond? Yeah, I have a question. So what, um, what determines how often a song gets played on our station, mm -hmm. on, on, on civil radio? So the volunteers do. Um, so, so is that like a like a call in, or is that just uh, based on what the or the programmer, or the programmer chooses? So I would hope that the programmers are getting feedback from community members. They're paying attention to people who call in or email them, um, and they're evaluating what's value, what, what what's popular, what's interesting, or new in the community. But ultimately, it's up to the programmer to decide what they're going to play um and what artists they're going to play and so then the music director at the end of every week reviews what new artists have been played by those volunteers uh and uh, and and assembles the charts as a result of those those da that data that they that they log so okay. call-ins can impact that our we actually uh our music director steven we pay him every month every week to produce the national earshot top 20 radio show which gets played at different radio stations across the country uh so he gets played on 10 different radio stations every week being canada's underground ryan seacrest is is the way i refer to it um and yeah and he encourages when he hosts that show he says make sure to call into your local radio station or volunteer and let them know what you want to hear so that you can have a hand in influencing these charts that i'm reading the top 20 for this week does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, as volunteers, you're crafting the charts. And whatever influences who you decide to play, that's that's answering the chart. That, that That's what's crafting those charts collaboratively. Uh, how about um, how about when, when, the, when the times that there are no content or there are no programmer running um, any programs on the radio? So those times, uh, I I noticed that music are being play being played, but who plays those music? Good. So good question. And at CIVL, different stations will do it differently. But at CIVL, yeah, we're not counting the automated plays. So okay. our music director reviews content, decides are we putting this album in our library or not. When you enter the room, you see the discard CDs, and we're offering them to students. Maybe you want these. Our music director didn't put it in our library, didn't catalog it, didn't keep it in the studio library, but maybe you'll like it. Um, and so the ones that the music director does put in our library, we put into our playlists. They automatically get played through. But because no volunteer is selecting that play, uh, our music director doesn't count it in the charts. Okay, understood. So, and you know, a different music director or different volunteers who join our organization and participate in the programming committee going forward uh, could make the decision to do it differently. Uh, but that's the operating protocol we follow through here and different stations may do it differently. So there's no rule that fits all for everybody. Um, but that's, that's to answer your question, that's how it looks here. Yeah, and that actually makes more sense because uh, I thought about how how often like how much percentage of time uh there's no um there are no programs being run and that just that just makes me concerned about 
what the charts are actually being determined by because um yeah we want it determined by by individuals and not by yeah. the just the automation you're right yes yeah good yeah That's good great. question i agree and yeah obviously the, the the charts will be more robust and more representative the more volunteers we have and the more programs we have and the more music they're playing right we also for instance if you play an album four times that album because we're charting albums not songs if you play four yep. songs off the same album in one show that'll count as one play for that week if another show plays that album that'll count as two does that make sense okay so just so that we can't stack the charts one volunteer can't stack the charts yeah. Cool. Okay. Um. Yesterday, when I'm pretty sure it was you, you were showing me the playlist. Yeah. You know, just the track list you had. Um. I remember it was kind of I don't know the songs were kind of rock and kind of alternative. Some of them, yeah. Uh, or a lot but, of them, maybe. Yeah. Uh. But I was just thinking of like, is it like very kind of genre focused? Because I was thinking like, if you have the volunteers choosing a lot of the um songs that get played, I mean there's different music tastes that get put in. And I, I remember asking about the genre and I don't I think I got like a concrete answer. And I was just thinking if like one person wants to put on something that's like, I don't know, maybe like more bluesy and then the next person wants to put on something more like metal-y, like, yeah. Totally fine. That's um, what we're here for. Okay. But the idea is that you're programming your hour. So when you when you come in and you do your show, you'll program whatever content it is, whatever content you want. You may choose to ask, can my show be after the blues show or before the blues show? Because I have a this show, that'll go well. Or you may say, I'm playing this type of music. You don't have any shows that go along with that kind of music. So I want my slot to be, you know, cordoned off somewhere where I'm not hearing other music at that just before that will be different. Um, as far as when nobody's on the air, that's, it's basically an archived randomization of all the music that our music director has put into our library. So it's reflected that like most of the artists we're going to get at the station are going to be folky, singer songwritery, rock oriented of some sort, maybe a lot of blues, maybe some jazz. Um, but it's rare to get those other types of music. So the, the, the list we see is populated by the different content that we've got submitted. If you're really into jazz, and you keep bringing in new jazz records that you'd like our music director to put into the library, over time, we will have more jazz being randomized through the playlist. Um, but yeah, it's expected that it's going to be hard one to another. Do you, you, your question that you didn't get an answer for, what kind of music do you play? You play whatever music. And so it's up to every individual volunteer. I want my hour to be this music. And maybe you don't want it to be one type of music. Maybe you want your, your show to be a show where I play... Uh, a di I do a different theme every week, irrespective of genre. Maybe this week it's songs about money. Next week it's songs about hair um, all across the genre spectrum. And it's your decision what you air, what kind of content you put together. Okay. Is that a little more clear? Yeah. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, I think the genre is kind of randomized because you're not listening because you want to hear a specific genre, but because you want to be part of the community, which is why it's a community radio. A hundred percent. That is the concept. A, because you want to be a part of the community. B, you want to be re represented, reflected new things. If I only listen to metal music, well, maybe I'm interested in finding out more different types of music. We have uh, music that I wouldn't naturally be select. Like my algorithm is going to show me on Spotify stuff that's similar to what I listen to. Maybe I want to find something different. And this is the place to do that or a significant place to do that. Um, but again, yeah, if you want, if you think you'd like to see more this, that or the other style, like come in, spend some time, talk to our music director, see where you can look into new music that you want to bring in for us, that you want him to process for us and add to those playlists. And that's 100% the idea of, of engaging new volunteers. Okay. Also with um, like the adding music to the library, is that just like you you get the song from like any source where you get the highest quality? Like you mentioned, bringing in a record or... So people, most of the mail we get at the radio station and at most radio stations is going to be physical submissions. And then a lot of the emails we get, it's getting out of hand, really, that our inboxes are just filled with promotional emails with the electronic press kit and the downloads for different artists and their songs and albums. So ultimately, I mean, that is uh, that, that that's how we get the content is people solicit us. People are high. It's a huge industry. 
Um, and in fact, such a big industry that the NCRA has invested capital infrastructure into a platform called the EDDS. It's the Earshot Digital Distribution System. They don't want anybody sending CDs anymore. They want everybody to log into EDDS, upload their music there, and then our music directors can download it from there. And that's also a platform where that's where our music director shares the Earshot 20 show every week on that platform. So they're investing in that platform to be the spot to get music. In the meantime, while it's being developed and, and it's getting off the ground and being improved, all sorts of ways. People send us music, people bring it in and say hi. Uh, an album, well, an artist will play in town and give us a CD. Uh, so it's all over the place, really. So you as a volunteer, if you bring us in new music or show us new music, um, let's say you found an artist that hadn't solicited us. We don't have any of their content here. Steve and our music director uh, may email them and say, hey, music director, or hey, uh, promoter person or manager or label head, can you send us electronic copies of this album so that we can include it in our library? And they'll do that. Okay. Or hopefully they'll do that. Good to move on from your shot, probably. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time about that. We're going to go back now to our PowerPoint presentation. So that was the NCRA. Hope uh, it was valuable for us to talk about. Our mission, values, and goals. So you're asking, society, uh, you're asking about charities. Are we a charity or are we not a charity? Um, so the Societies Act governs all nonprofits. Uh, in BC, there's a National Societies Act for national societies. We are a BC society, CIVL. Any society, any nonprofit organization can become a charity if they fulfill one of the four categories of charity. Um, and they need some other requirements too. But ultimately, long, long and short of your question is, uh, is that radio stations in Canada at this time cannot be eligible to be charities, even community radio stations. So there are a couple. Carlton CKCU is a charity. Co-op Radio CFRO uh, 1027 in Vancouver is a charity, but they are legacy charities. They've been grandparented in that charity status. Um, generally, the, the if you're a nonprofit and you are either educational, so every university in Canada is a charity. Every post-secondary institution is a charity. Uh, education, religion, every temple, mosque, church, what have you, they're all charities. Um, uh, education, religion, easing poverty, so soup kitchens and uh, homeless services, those are also charities. And then the fourth category is contributing to the greater good in society. Uh, so that's like Children's Cancer Society, Heart and Stroke Foundation, Alzheimer's uh, Research and Support. All of these types of organizations can be charitable. When you're a charitable organization, you do have to file different financial documents at the end of the year. There's certain... Uh, administrative responsibilities you have to follow through with that are particular to being a charity. And then you can also offer when somebody contributes funds to you, if you're not giving them a value back, you can give them a tax write-off so that they can tell the government, hey, I made X amount of money, but Y amount of that money was spent on charities. So don't count it as my income, please. And then you don't have to pay as many as much in taxes. Um, but so to answer your question, nonprofits that are radio stations are not eligible to be charities anymore. Uh, so we established as a society in 2005, in June of 2005, the UFP students created the U, at the time, UCFV Campus Community Radio State Society, updated so that we're now the UFV Campus Community Radio Society. And the goal was to broadcast on FM radio to the students of Abbotsford, Mission, and Chilliwack uh, in the community. So we're only just achieving that ultimate goal by including Chilliwack now. Um, and we want to contribute to the greater good in society. If we read our letters patent, our mandate, broadly speaking, we're a place to encourage the exchange and promotion of ideas, uh, discussion, arts, culture, different philosophies, pol pol political perspectives uh, that aren't represented broadly. Um, to bring all these pieces together, to be a cultural melting pot, to be a hub of arts and culture and, uh, and, and academia in the Valley. And um, where do we stand on separating art from the artist? Well, that's a guess to each individual, right? Like the radio station does not as a whole 
make a stance on take a stance on that. We have guidelines of programming content. Nowhere in our particular guidelines does it say don't play R. Kelly, right? Don't play Michael Jackson. But we might, our programming committee might come up with some sort of guidelines. Let's say there's an artist who's convicted or accused of some bad thing. Uh, the programming committee might say, we won't play this artist. And that'll be up to the volunteer and staff that are participating in that committee to make that decision. Cancel culture is alive and well. That's the question really that you're getting at here, I imagine broadly, um, is where do we stand on those issues? And the question is, it's on a case by case basis. Like if you're asking me to personally, I won't get into it. Uh, but you know, I'm a, I'm relatively progressive, and I think most people in campus community radio you'll find are pretty liberal progressives. Um, but like I said, we want you to follow through with the radio requirements and and uh, that the government set. Um, and beyond that, as long as you're being appropriate and respectful, we may disagree on some pieces. Um, but you'll you'll follow through with the content guidelines. So if the content is acceptable, generally. That should be acceptable. You know, can I promise that the programming committee next month, depending on who's a part of it, won't say, don't play Arcade Fire because of the thing that happened last year where it came out that the singer from the Arcade Fire was having inappropriate relationships with people who he had priority or privilege over and Vice dropped off his tour and things like this. Um, I can't promise they won't do that, but we don't do those things yet. Uh, I think we made a decision not to play Headley a while ago, though. So in that sense, we haven't separated that artist from that art. Yes. Uh, as an example. Yeah. But then it, that, that, that said, if you played Headley on your show and it didn't go outside of your top, your 10% your hits, uh, I don't, you know, you're not going to be suspended for that or, or sanctioned for that. Um, but you might, if you did that, prompt members of the programming community to say, Oh, we played Headley. What do we do about this? And then you'd have to take it up with them, right? Yeah. As a group. So it's a collective, it's a collective process. Right. Uh, history of civil radio. So I mentioned the Societies Act in 2005 was established. Uh, from there in 2006, students voted whether or not they would want to spend on campus radio. They did. Uh, in 2006, agree to spend $3 every semester on campus radio, which gave us a whopping $60,000 every year, whether we liked it or not. Um, and so that was enough to get things started. By 2008, uh, we were podcasting on our website. Uh, as of March 2008, uh, they had funded a website. They had connected with different volunteers in the community. They had hired some staff. They had built a studio space. They had actually built several studio spaces and then UFV had restructured things. So they tore down two or three studio spaces. Uh, and in fact, this I think is our fifth studio space. So there's been a lot of money that the UFV yeah. Campus Community Radio Society has spent that we've lost just because, you know, yeah. UFV told us to move, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, we were up and running by 2008. And by 2010, September 7th, 2010. Oh, look at that. That's today, right? Today, September 7th? Yes. So today yeah. marks the 13 year anniversary of CIVL being on FM radio. Uh, and we we implemented with a temporary tower that was on top of the cafeteria here. Uh, we broadcasted there for two and a half years or so, or maybe a year and a half. Valentine's Day 2012, we moved to our permanent tower with the CDC in West Abbotsford uh, and went to full power at that point. Nice. So now 11 years later, we are testing on 92.3 FM in Chilliwack for the first time. Right. Yeah. So does this mean that all community radios are crowdfunded with a little bit of help from the government through operating funding? You can call it crowdfunding. Mm, I wouldn't say primarily. It's a hybrid model. And it's to every community radio station. Like, it is a struggle. You're struggling to figure out where they get their money yeah. because it's a struggle to yeah. figure out where we're going to get yeah. our money. How are we going to advertise enough? How are we going to get enough grant funding? How are we going to get enough sponsorship? So, yeah, it's a grind. It's a, yeah. Campus radio stations are incredibly privileged compared to the community stations yes. in terms of what their funding looks like. Oh, yes, very much so. so. That's a huge issue that you're touching on here. Right. So through government grants, through operating funding, would it be enough to just break even? Or is it just like you still need a little more? 
probably still need a little more. Yeah. Like at CIVL, where we're at now, student enrollment has been down. We've lost about $40,000 since the start of COVID compared right. to what we projected to earn. Right. Uh, the tower has been more expensive than we planned for. So we're like 100 grand, grand in the hole compared yeah. to where we thought we'd be in 2019. So for us, BC Gaming funding, if we could establish uh, sustainable annual funding from them for our various programs, that would be enough probably to keep us in a decent level um, going forward. But uh uh, it wouldn't be enough. The BC Gaming only matches portions of your funding. Yeah. So they're, they're not there to fund your whole operation. Right. Basically, community rate, like I said, many of them operate based on strictly volunteers. Yeah. So primarily, they just don't pay for staff. Yeah. That's what community stations generally right. do, is they'll have volunteers running their operation, really committed people. But why does UVic um, qualify for the BC Gaming? It's not that they qualify and we don't. It's that they've been successful in applying for it and we haven't. So we all should qualify. Yeah. Many stations haven't looked into it though. Right. Oh, I see. I've looked into it. We got feedback. We'll make some updates. Da 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 da. We'll apply again. Hopefully, we'll be successful. Right. Um. Well, this is gonna sound a bit random, but like, let's say if the parent company of Timmy's wanted to open a ra a community radio station independent of Tim Hortons mm -hmm. and have Tim Hortons sponsor that community radio station, mm -hmm. technically they would be able to cycle money and get free advertising that way. They could, if they operated it that way. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know what the government would say if they saw a nonprofit that was created by the Tim Hortons Corporation and how it like yeah if Tim Hortons had a really great application that clearly explained how their business operation yeah. is different from this philanthropic initiative, yeah. I don't see any reason if there was spectrum free uh, spectrum space for them to have a new radio station, and they were interested in it, it uh, they could do it. You know, like the Abbotsford Canucks have the Abbotsford Canucks Foundation, which is a charity, which is a place for them to do community uh community philanthropy right? right um which is their charity right yeah. look, look, most corp ronald mcdonald house for mcdonald's right like corporations do this all the time right no but i i haven't seen a corporation who's yeah. done what you're thinking of but this is what makes you valuable in the corporate boardroom is thinking of these innovative ideas you see where i'm coming from yeah so that's a little bit of a history of civl okay. uh structure of civl Y'all are volunteers. You're coming to volunteer. We've talked about a number of the different ways that volunteers can engage, and there's really innumerable the number of ways that volunteers can engage. We can think about new ones. Uh, I mentioned one committee. I showed you those NCRA committees, but yeah, programming committee is, is the primary committee at CIVL that makes decisions with regards to policy about what happens in programming or on air. Uh, do we sanction a volunteer or discipline them? Um, so what are the rules and how do we implement the rules? Uh, what kind of new programs will we approve? What kinds of syndicated programs will we approve? Different pieces like this. That happens at the programming committee level. So that's made up of board members and staff and volunteers where we come together and make collaborative decisions. We may have program promotions committees. We may have technical committees. There was a conference committee when we hosted the conference. We will have hiring committees. And generally, again, it'll be board, staff, and volunteers to, to run these committees at various times. Uh, of course, the staff are paid to do a job. And that job generally includes facilitating, supporting, and supervising volunteers like yourselves in order to meet the expectations of our operations. Um, so the staff are paid, and they work with the committees and volunteers to further our, our goals and our operations. Uh, and then the board of directors, the board of directors are responsible for the ultimate big picture, long-term visioning of the organization. Board uh, responsibilities tend to include fundraising, um, policy, uh, and again, those long-term relationship building pieces. Um, and so the board members are volunteers. They'll run on occasion to be elected. Uh, and uh, they're basically the they are the ownership. They represent the ownership and we buy insurance to indemnify them against uh, wrongdoing. If let's say the staff or generally speaking, the radio station were to make mistakes and be sued, uh, the board members wouldn't have to pay out of pocket because we'd have insurance to cover that uh, as long as they followed through with their, their responsibilities effectively. Uh, what I do talk about here, the board should be made up of primarily volunteers and other community members who are volunteering their time on the board. But 
uh, what we go through in this section is to discuss that, well, volunteers who volunteer at the radio station may end up being members of the board of directors, in which case those volunteers will be ownership. And by virtue of being ownership, they'll be the employer of the staff. So, but if you're on my board of directors and you're my employer, and you're also hosting a radio show where I supervise you as a volunteer, yeah. that's a weird little yeah. Venn diagram of a snake eating its tail, right? So we need to be careful, both the staff and the volunteer board members themselves have to be careful to, you wear different hats in different scenarios. Yeah. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you didn't see me take off my hat and, and show my bald head. So you're lucky. Um, but uh, uh, so we want volunteer, what we want to avoid is a volunteer, let's say gets disciplined by a staff member for something they did in their volunteer role. Let's say they decided never to play Canadian music on their show. And the staff member says, look, you have to play Canadian music. Those are the rules. And the volunteer says, you know, up yours. I'm not going to be doing it. And in fact, I'm going to go to the board and I'm going to take that out on you as a staff member at the board where I have authority on you. At the same time, if the board says, staff, your reports, they need to be clearer now. We need different reporting from you. And the staff is upset about this. And they say, up yours. You board members who are volunteers, I'm going to give you a hard time. You, you want me to make more reports? Well, now you're going to make more reports too. So none of this should be happening, right? We need to be respectful of our multiple positions and the oversight. Uh, this is common in all nonprofits. It's not unique to campus radio. Board members who are volunteers, uh, and the full-time staff that operate those organizations. We want to be careful about what hat we're wearing and what situation and what relationship we're representing while we engage. Any questions about this structure? So we're almost done here. Different campus and community radio stations. I've mentioned a couple. Here's, uh, I mentioned two of the three that are going to be on this list. So 1019 is CITR at UBC. That's 1019 in Vancouver. TR stands for Thunderbird Radio because their mascot is a Thunderbird, although you might call it an ostrich or an emo. Don't ask me, I don't work there. But notice they're on 101.9. So we're on 101.7. So that means if they broadcast further east and or we broadcast further west, we could interfere with each other. In fact, when CIVL started on 101.7, we were told you have to protect against CITR to the west. And further, in fact, a couple, about a year or two ago, CITR came to me, they said, Aaron, we're looking at uh, expanding eastbound. We're going to need your sign off for that. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'd like to expand westbound eventually. So how's this going to work? Let's talk about this. And I asked for more details. I didn't hear more details. I don't know where that's going on their end. Maybe they're not doing it anymore. Hopefully not. But maybe they are. I think it's important for us. Once we're done with all this Chilliwack work, we should be looking at covering more of Langley, more of Surrey, because where do we have students at UFV and faculty and staff? in Surrey and Langley. So I think we should be expanding west eventually. Yeah. In that case, we'll need CITR to say, oh, yeah, they're going to expand westbound and we'll and we're okay with that. So it works two ways, right? Yeah. That's a little bit about UBC. They're about 100 years old now. It's been a 100-year-old radio station there. Right. And uh, you said that there was only like one station in the Yukon, right? And then would we be... Well, Right. I'm familiar with one. There's right. at least one, is what I'll say. Yes. And well, let's say it's not the competition is not as stiff as in the lower mainland. So if we were to just open a station there, would we be able to do so? Who's we? Um, I guess civil radio. What would UFV Campus Community Radio Society's interest be in opening a radio station in the Yukon? Maybe to try and pull in more students. Where the competition's less stiff, you can take up more land. Interesting. Yes. You're saying just like we expanded to Chilliwack, why don't we expand to Whitehorse? Yes. I mean, I imagine the government would have some questions about this, but if you had good answers, I mean, I, I don't see why not necessarily. Uh, yeah. Like this, again, this is what makes you valuable in the corporate boardroom is these innovative ideas uh, that kind of go a little bit against the grain, but right. presumably there would be groups in, in the Yukon who would be interested in putting together their own, uh, campus community radio station right. there or their own community yeah. radio station there you'll have to show when you apply for a frequency that you have community support so i mean if the people in the yukon or in whitehorse if there are organizations and groups there that are like you know what we do want, we want to send our students to ufv yeah. sure you should promote here 
maybe that would be okay. Right. Uh, but you would have to sh demonstrate the case that this makes sense. Right. It more makes more sense that you would create a Yukon Community Radio Society yeah. and that that society would uh, would would open a new radio station. And maybe from there, you would partner with UFV for a variety of reasons and want to get advertising right. dollars from UFV to help you operate, maybe, because you're, they're going to draw your students. Right. Mm, right. Yeah. Interesting, interesting thoughts. Yep. Interesting thoughts. Okay. So that's 1019 CITR UBC. SFU, I mentioned that earlier with Earshot because of Magnus from SFU who runs Earshot. Notice it's CJSF for SFU. 90.1 FM. They uh, just celebrated 20 years on FM. So we've just celebrated 20 years as an organization as a whole, uh, or we're celebrating, we're in the process. Uh, and they've they've been on FM for, for 20 years now. Um, and so they were the youngest station before us in campus radio in Canada. And then there's, I've mentioned this a couple of times, CFRO, Vancouver Co-op Radio. So they are a community station based uh, in the downtown east side, like Maine and Hastings is literally where their 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 station is. And their work primarily or to a large degree focuses on uh, underhoused populations, addictions, indigenous communities, uh, intersectionalities there, providing services for the high, at high risk um, in the Vancouver area and around. Uh, so that is one primary focus of this community radio station, and a lot of their funding focuses on providing those services. Uh, they used to be on 1027 FM, which uh, recently was the peak, uh, but uh, Pattison, who owns the peak, or owned the peak, bought, basically, they engaged in a frequency swap with CFRO, because CFRO is a community radio station, not too much money. The frequency 1027 has lots of space around it where you can go far and not to run into other radio stations. So Pattison was able to finance to fund the broadcast uh, across that wide range, whereas CFRO couldn't. So they traded frequencies. They swapped frequencies. And uh, I think it was like a million dollars, over a million dollars that CFRO got from Pattison, including the in-kind value to create the the promotional material that promoted the new logo and whatnot of 100.5. They also got uh, uh, on the Pattison billboards, like at at uh, at uh, bus stops and whatnot. They also got placements there as part of the deal. Um, and I understand it was a very difficult decision for their board of directors in terms of what do we do with this money? How do we invest it properly? And they wanted to do it ethically. So they didn't want to be investing in oil and they didn't want to be investing in, let's say, Israeli uh, companies yeah. that were contributing to a, 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 to what they say, what they see, and what I see is Israeli apartheid and whatnot. Um, not everyone will agree that that's what that is, but uh, I'm unafraid of saying so because I, I happen to be Jewish, so I'm I'm comfortable acknowledging right. Israeli apartheid as it is. Um. Okay, the last pieces we have here. So what kind of programs do we have at CIVL? And we'll just talk really broadly here. We've kind of discussed a little bit about different types of music programs you can have, right? Or different topics you can talk about very briefly. Uh, but we'll break them out into three general types of content, which is spoken word content. And it's a show where you're mostly talking. Uh, you can play music in a spoken word program. But if you want to have a spoken word program, we'd expect that you'd play no more than like two songs throughout your spoken word program. You could also have a music program where we would require that you do talk. It's not just playing music, it's a playlist of music, that's all. You have to talk for at least 10% every hour. So give information about the music or it doesn't really have to be information about the music, but some local talk, some local content. Um, you could have a mixture show though. If you want to do like, 20 minutes of talk and 40 minutes of music or 20 minutes of music and 40 minutes of talk mixture show. I don't want to stick to only two songs, but I don't want to have to talk um, all the time, but I do want to talk a lot. We'll call it a mixture show that we have to have a minimum of 15% of talk throughout the week, every week. So that's why we look at these three different designations uh, so that we can maintain at every, at all times, make sure that every week has the appropriate amount of spoken word content on air. We also have syndicated programs that come from elsewhere. So like the Earshot program that Stephen hosts that I mentioned, that goes elsewhere. And we have other programs, like I mentioned Democracy Now! earlier, that we air every every day uh, that is from an outside source. Uh, questions? Okay. 
Last couple pieces, expectations of programmers. So every time I've talked about the regulator and the government and applications and things like this, the rules and regulations, they're set by the CRTC. Do we know what the CRTC is? Anybody know what that stands for? Canadian Radio. Canadian Radio, yes. Um, Technically, it's a TTC. Technically, there should be two Ts. Um, the NCRA should have two Cs, Campus and Community Radio Association, and the CRTC has, should have two Ts, but it only has one. Is Kelly part of it? It sure is. It's part of it twice. It's the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission. So that means that they're responsible for regulating and legislating radio, television, and telecommunications. So that means how much Rogers or Bell can charge you for your cell phone data usage, that's governed by the CRTC. They make those rules. Can they throttle you if you use a website that's owned by one of their competitors? That's governed by the CRTC. Can they shut you down for not paying your bill? That's to the CRTC. Can you complain to them for your service being bad? That's according to the CRTC. Did Rogers fail to provide internet to the entire country for an entire 24 hour period to a country that was paying for internet service? Yes, they did. What do we do about that? That's a, up to the CRTC. Uh, can Facebook charge uh, or be charged to share news? which is a current question that they're addressing, decided by the CRTC. Um, so they're at, they're the regulator for all radio, television, and telecommunications, as well as, do you have a complaint about a broadcast you heard? The CRTC would make the determination of is there punishment or sanction for that radio station, so on and so forth. Everything to do with these worlds are regulated by the CRTC. And their overall overarching policy has not been updated in 30 years. So the CRTC last month, actually, as of now, it's September 2023, the CRTC just told us that they're going to spend so much time renewing their policies that they're actually not going to consider any technical amendments or updates for the next two years. If you want to expand your radio station, not till 2025. We've got other stuff to deal with, they're saying. All right. uh, so that's where they're at. And that's a little bit about them. We usually will have CRTC commissioners at the conference every year talking to us and taking questions. Uh, so it's a good opportunity to get engaged with that. Our broadcast license itself is issued by the Innovation, Science, and Economic Development Department of Canada. So although the CRTC comes up with the legislation, the regulations, we have to get ISED's approval to finally officially broadcast. So you apply to the CRTC with the parameters you're looking for, and they say, okay, you're approved pending ISED sanction. And so they have to be the final step to approve you as a broadcaster. And if your technical operations are impeding other stations or not operating as they're supposed to, it's ISED who will be responsible uh, for revoking or, or issuing that license. So how do we maintain our CRTC license? Well, we, we, we provide these trainings. Next session will be rules and regulations. After that, you'll be asked to sign a volunteer contract. And that contract will say that you'll agree with our volunteer agreements and expectations. So if you violate those agreements and expectations, you will be sanctioned. And then the CRTC knows that, okay, so if somebody swears on air, is the station going to go off air? No, as long as the station is following through with the protocol expected, which is that, what are your rules for swearing on air? The rules are don't do it. And if you do, you're suspended or expelled. Um, and they'll want to know that we follow through with those rules and regulations. And if we do, presumably... As long as they, we haven't let that person on air in irresponsible ways, they've gone through training and we they acknowledge, oh yeah, I made this mistake. It was, it was my fault. Uh, I'll suffer the consequences. Then things should be okay after that complaint. If we decide, if staff are there making decisions that like we're just going to air content that is inappropriate according to the regulations, likely there will be sanctions. There have only been a couple examples in Canada of stations receiving sanctions. Um, and they usually last until your next license renewal, at least, or two license renewals. And licenses are generally generally renewed for seven years at a time. Uh, well, I'll show you. So uh, we can find out about our volunteer agreement and expectations. At, there's a CIVL WordPress that we keep with all the details of that. Um, I, I just Google CIVL volunteer info blog every time I'm looking for it. And it comes right up. 
uh, and I can circulate that that document and we'll look at it in the rules and regulations session as well. Uh, volunteering in civil radio. So you don't have to do all this training to volunteer at civil radio. You can pop in, participate, but in order to be able to have the agency to use the space when staff aren't here or unsupervised by, by staff and go out in the community and represent CIVL as a volunteer, you'll have to go through this process and uh, sign that volunteer agreement. But once you do, welcome to the party. Uh, and we always want to remember being on air is a privilege. It's not a right. We do pay for it as students um, and we contribute our volunteer time and that is incredibly valuable. But at the same time, it doesn't give us the right to do whatever we want with it. Again, if we're taking money for plays or if we're broadcasting inappropriate content, we're risking the privilege that everybody has um, by doing so because we could be sanctioned or we could lose privileges. Even on campus, if we were to have volunteers that were disrupting operations in the building here, we could uh, lose privileges from within UFE. Uh, you said no swearing, but what, what does that come to with like music? Uh, so that's something we talk about in the second session, the rules and regulation session. We're through my PowerPoint here. So I'm going to turn this off and say that I'm going to stop recording and say that uh, people who want to learn about the swearing in music and how that works will have to tune into the second uh, volunteer orientation session. But thanks for joining this one. And there will be a link that lets you take session number two right away. There's also... If you do want to volunteer after watching this PowerPoint presentation, uh, you will be able to, or you will, we will ask you to uh, fill out a Google form questionnaire to show that you've been paying attention. You didn't just tell us that you listened to the training session. It'll be a questionnaire, skill testing questions uh, that you'll then be asked to go over with a staff member. And so rather than scheduling a, ten, a two hour training session with a staff member, it's something we can do even quickly over the phone. Just check check the boxes to see if you've, if you've completed uh, watching the video, paid attention, and if you've internalized the stuff we've gone over. So when you contact a staff member, info at civl.ca or programming at civl.ca, they will forward you that link. You'll have the opportunity to submit the form. Once you do that for the various training sessions, you can sign a volunteer contract. Thanks so much for watching. Okay, and it's gonna now it's stopping the recording. Great. Uh oh, is it still recording? Pause, stop recording. Oh, that stopped the screen share. Ah, I'm gonna look silly in the recording.